All right. I know there's some people still joining us, but uh, I want to get us started. Um, thank you all for uh, joining us here. My name is Paul Anderson. I'm the executive director for the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. We're based down in Stonington, Maine, and, and I'm sure many of you know us and we know you, but I, I suspect there's folks that are learning about us today. And welcome to all of you. We're a nonprofit based on the harbor that works to sustain fishing and fishing communities. In, uh, in this part of the world. Uh, we do that through collaborative research, collaborative management, and collaborative education programs. Um, we like people. We tend to like working with people. And I think today's uh, uh, conversation that you're gonna be a part of will be an apt demonstration of, of how we go about doing this important work on sustaining fisheries. Um, we believe that the uh, success of our coastal fishing communities really depends greatly on all of us working together. So welcome. Uh, this is our Lunch and Learn series. Um, it's been very successful over the last couple of summers, and many of you were probably in the room to enjoy them in person at our facility on the harbor in Stonington. But because of the situation we're all in, we've decided we've got to take this online, at least for now. And in fact, I think we have greater capacity because if you've been to that room before and it's full, we get 40 or so people in there with standing room only. And in this case, you don't have to stand. Um, but uh, we hope to open this facility up later in the summer and perhaps can do our lunch and learns in both in person and online. So this is our first go at the webinar thing. We're all familiar with, with Zoom as are many of you. But this is our first approach at presenting it. And I think we have the kinks worked out, but uh, we'll find out and we'll all learn together. I wanna to thank quickly the team at Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries that helped put this together, including Mike and Pat, who are on the screen with you, uh, as well as Chelsea uh, and, uh, and Tate Yoder, who's helped behind the scenes to put this together. Um, We'll uh, go through the presentation and there'll hopefully be plenty of time for you to ask some questions. And Pat's gonna help to curate the Q&A at the end of the hour. Um, so welcome and I'll hand it over to Mike and I'm gonna disappear and listen with all of you. Mike. Thanks Paul. And um, as far as those questions, if questions pop up um, in your people's heads um, while this is going on, please utilize the chat box, right Pat? Um, and you can just send and stick questions right in the chat box and Pat's gonna keep, keep it kind of a running tally and, and ask some of the ones that were kind of rose to the top and, and Siona from Maine Coast Heritage Trust will, um, um, her and I will jump in and kind of field some of those questions. So as Paul said, uh, welcome. Um, hi, mom and dad. And uh, we'll get started here. Um, again, we're gonna to talk today about alewives. Uh, an anadromous fish that's a big spring happening here in Maine and along the eastern coast. And we're going to talk about the communities around here and the great potential for fisheries co-management of this fishery. And if you don't know much about co-management or alewives, then hopefully this, uh, this talk will to address a lot of that. So as Paul mentioned, we're a nonprofit fisheries organization here in Stonington, Maine, about halfway up the coast of Maine. If, if folks are tuning in from somewhere else and want to know what kind of place this is. There's a, a shot of the harbor there, although today it's socked in with fog, so it'd be a pretty white screen right now. Um, but that's where we are, and that's a, our kind of organization. And so we'll um, kind of jump into alewives here and apologize for some of the, this video might be a little choppy, but um, I think you'll get the hint. So this is actually happening right now in streams um, on our Blue Hill Peninsula and along the coast of Maine right now, where alewives are coming back in, um, their average numbers, which is incredible numbers, and it's a time where everyone describes streams as running blacks and kids are going down to the to the streams and wondering if they could actually maybe walk across the backs of these things. And just to give you an idea of, of how many fish are coming back, um, they showed up around May 1st this year when they normally do and they run for about a month. And this is kind of our, our annual spring um, sort of reminder of the connection that our coastal communities have with the, with the salt water and the open ocean. It's a really exciting time of year in the spring. Oops. Um, so we'll, first we'll talk a little bit about the um, an alewife life cycle. Um, this is a, a, a map that kind of gives you the, the range of alewives. The orange um, range there is, is native habitat. And actually the, the 
burgundy sort of red shaded arrows there. You can see my arrow here. Um, these are places like the Great Lakes where alewives exist, but right are actually um, invasive species. And this can actually be kind of a challenge for us. A lot of the work we do, um, whether it's most of it's around restoration, that type of work, if people don't know what alewives are, often they'll Google an alewife and a lot of the, the press out there is negative around alewives because people have dealt with a lot of real big issues with alewives coming into places that they weren't. And so it brings up a lot of hesitation or, you know, that folks might have on, is an alewife good for a pond? And so that's a big part of this talk and others that we give like it is, um, they can be bad in places where they're invasive, like any invasive animal, but in places where they're native, um, they're nothing but beneficial. And that's why uh, this work's so important. So um, right now you can see that little alewife out in the Atlantic Ocean on the, on the screen there. We're in spring, and so the fish are swimming back to the ocean, to the, the pond that they were born in, just like salmon, alewives return to the, to pond, the pond that they were born in using um, olfactory senses and some magnetic fields and things like that. They end up finding their way back to their, their home pond. About 95% of them do. There's a small percentage that actually stray into other ponds, but most of them come right back to the place they were born. And so they're swimming back up right now into their ponds, they move in in huge numbers, and when the temperature is right in the water and the conditions are right, they all spawn in big aggregate groups where they, they call it broadcast spawning, where they go into the shallows in a pond and sort of um, broadcast seed and, and sperm all over the place. And, and so they'll, they'll do that in the ponds. They'll, the adults, pretty much as soon as they come in, um, they'll spawn and get the heck right out of there. It takes about a month to come in and about a night to get out. Um, and then the juveniles, the eggs will are negatively buoyant, so they'll settle down into the, the into the reeds and the grass in a the pond. They'll hatch in several weeks, and then they'll spend the whole summer in that pond, um, feeding on zooplankton and growing to about an inch or so long. And then they'll all leave um, at once, pretty much in the pond, and we get our, our fall rains. And then they will take off, and they'll go down to the estuary, where they'll spend uh, about a year or so, sometimes a little bit longer, and that really, um, nutrient rich environment and they'll grow to a, several inches long before they'll take off on, on their big journey up and down the, the Atlantic coast and their ranges. They'll mingle with, um, with other Atlantic carrying species up and down the coast and can be found all the way down to Carolina before coming back to their, um, their homes again, their home ponds to spawn and start that cycle all over again. And so um, a big, one other piece of the, the ecology of alewives is, is what do they eat? Um, so that's one thing that we always talk about when we talk about, you know, uh, the, the ecological importance of a, of a fish. And alewives eat zooplankton basically their entire lives. From the time they're, they're juvenile fish, you know, just a few centimeters long, they're eating zooplankton in ponds. And then when they're out in the open ocean, they're eating zooplankton out there. And one real um, reason why that's so important is they're basically taking the zooplankton is eating phytoplankton that the sun basically feeds, and then alewives are eating this zooplankton and turning that that sun that, that fed the phytoplankton and fed the zooplankton, and they're turning that into a protein source that's accessible by um, lots of other fish and so um, or other animals, lots of different kind of animals. So the other side of this point is what eats alewives? Um, so osprey eat alewives, eagles. Heron, gulls, fox eat on alewives, weasels and mink, cod, halibut, mackerel, Atlantic salmon, and other endangered species. Um, freshwater species like largemouth bass, pickerel, um, basically every pond that's got alewives in it has a whole lot more food come the summer when these um, alewives start hatching out and turning into small fish. And beavers actually don't eat alewives. But we'll, as a little teaser, we'll get into some beavers later. Um, but people certainly eat alewives and they're really good smoked. So a bigger question really is what doesn't eat alewives? And that's why they're this, the other reason why they're this keystone species. They're really, um, one of the, the guys we work with jokes they have, they might as well have food tattooed on the side of them because they really feed everything they can fit, they can fit in their mouths. And so um, they're a really important prey species. And they make ponds happy. Alewives are great for ponds. Um, they're actually um, net reducers in phosphorus in ponds by, by keeping that, those zooplankton um, populations in check. 
and reducing the amount of phosphorus reduces algal blooms and really clears up the water. There's lots of anecdotal stories of um, ponds not having alewives that used to and then being restocked with them and the water clearing up. Um, they also bring marine derived nutrients into streams and ponds and you can find some of those signatures, those carbon signatures in the trees and the other riparian plants around these streams and around these ponds. And that little picture in the left, bottom left corner um, right here, the freshwater mussel, that's also possible one of the reasons why they clear up fish. You'll find these, they're called alewife floaters in ponds that have alewives and you won't find them in ponds that don't have alewives. Um, and basically what these guys do is when they um, hatch their juvenile larval stage clams, those clams, those tiny ones you can't even see before they're grown out, will attach to alewife gills and make that trip to the ocean and back on the alewife before settling into the ponds and growing out into these freshwater mussels. And if you look in places like um, one of the places we work here, Walker Pond, you can't step three times in the bottom of the pond without kicking one of these little clams around. And so they're really important, um, even in ways that we don't see just because of food. So now we've got our, you know, our protagonist, the alewife, and any good story has got a struggle and it's got an antagonist. And so this graph's a really good way of showing um, what that struggle and what it actually happened in, in the in alewife history, where back in the 50s, you know, they were catching 70 million pounds of alewives in the Gulf of Maine, and they were a huge um, food source, uh, bait source. We actually internationally shipped quite a few alewives. And you can see right around the mid-1970s, that took a real big decline and um, almost down to nothing in 2005. If this went all the way to now, it'd be a little bit of a, a peak up there um, with things coming back right now, but you can see things really didn't look good for alewives for a little while. And this is a, a I'm going to show a, an animation that shows you're going to have population density off on, oh wait, back up. And they'll have, there. So on the right, you'll see population density in different parts of the Penobscot River. And on the left, you'll see dams being built as that, those populations started to pick up. And it's pretty clear um, that we did a really good job of building dams um, back in the day. And this is one of the big reasons why those, that you saw that really steep decline in river herring catches in the eastern Gulf of Maine. And basically what those dams do are, you know, stopping those fish from returning to those ponds and making new fish. And once you've lost several years in a row, you pretty much lose a whole run. I don't want to show it again. Um, so now we'll get into alewife management. Um, and this is where we'll start digging into that co-management and the complexity of, of what's going on here and the reason why things are succeeding. So we'll start at the first level. So you've got, um, they're managed on a federal, a state, and a local uh, way, which makes things really complicated, but ends up being the right thing, as you'll see. So at this federal level, you know, again, on the left, we've got the, the range of alewives. You can see this is, is a, you know, a huge area to be managing so many populations. You know, one, um, one trawl fishery could come through here, and, you know, maybe they're only catching 100,000 fish, something like that. But they could, if that's all coming from one place, they could wipe out a run completely with that. And this is, um, this is one of the reasons, again, there was overfishing in the alewife fishery. And a lot of it was because federal management really isn't that um, efficient at managing on this big of a scale for fine scale fisheries. And so what the feds did do, um, and they're, they're managed at the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Council. And what they did do and could do, they kind of have just really blunt tools at this level. And what they did when they saw the steep decline was they said, okay, we're putting a moratorium on, on alewives um, to be caught. And so they basically said, no more catching of alewives unless you can show exactly where they're coming from and that it's a sustainable population, which is pretty tough to do um, when you're looking at, at things out in the open ocean like that. So there's the federal level, not, a, not much capacity to do much other than those big uh, levers they can pull. And then, you know, moving down to a state level, you've got you know, we're getting a little bit closer. Now we can understand, you can bring in, you know, um, specific um, traditional or cultural um, things going on in Maine that are different than other states. And so you have some, a little bit more granularity on that management ability. But at the state level, you know, we've got 3,500 miles of coast in Maine and countless number of alewife streams. 
And I think right now at the Department of Marine Resources, there's about five full-time people that work um, on anadromous fish and another five that are seasonal that focus on alewives. And so there really just isn't the potential there to be able to manage at the local scale that, would, that these populations exist. <clears throat> and so that brings us down to the local level. Um, and so this is the Bagadoos estuary um, that Sion and I work in um, that has, um, I'll get into a, a more detailed map, but basically at this level, you've got people working that have a, a cultural connection to these ponds, to these fish that have watched them swim up and down these brooks their whole lives and that understand the nuances of, of the, the obstacles that those fish and that you know, stream specifically have to get over and, and what they have to deal with. And they have the capacity to actually be there um, to monitor these fisheries. And so that's where, that's where co-management comes into this, where alewives are actually one of two species, along with soft shell clam that are co-managed in the state of Maine, which basically means if the, a town can prove that they have a sustainable fishery, and we'll talk about what that means later, they can put together a management plan where instead of the state or the fed saying, here's how we're gonna manage this fishery, they can say, this is how many fish we have, this is how we're gonna manage it to make sure it's sustainable, and they're gonna monitor that to make sure that it is sustainable. And so it's at this level that you get all that capacity and that local knowledge, and where co-management, I think it's the kind of the blue ribbon on, on which one of those three levels it really takes to manage uh, this kind of fishery. And that's where a lot of our work at the, at the center is, is trying to cross those borders between state and federal and local management and that, um, that capacity that comes with local knowledge and local values and connections. So again, this is a, a, a screenshot of a Google Earth thing where you can see the five, there's five different ponds with, that have traditionally had alewives in them. Um, three of those, when Sion and I started this work, had alewives in them. So you can see Pierce and White's Pond and Walker's Pond all had alewives. And you'll notice that I made the Walker's Pond fish a little bit smaller, which will come up uh, a little bit later. But um, there are two other ponds, Parker Pond and Frost Pond, that didn't have alewives in them. And that's because of where these little red lines are, they were barriers to fish passage. This one's a, a culvert crossing Route 15. And this one's an old uh, dam that is um, an old earthen and mill dam that's at the mouth of Parker Pond. And so those we'll talk about a little bit of the, the restoration that's going on there. And they're you know, within these communities of uh, Penobscot, Brooksville, and Sedgwick. And so where a lot of this work started for me was um, moving here from Alaska, I think four and a half years ago or so, and, and being brought into this room um, where folks from all these different towns came in and with my um, background in anadromous fish um, met with me and started talking about all these places where they used to have fish and about all the management challenges that they were up against. And so, um, so my, a lot of my work has been working with those folks in those towns on how to achieve these goals. And so one of the towns, and, and again, in order for them to manage these fisheries, each town has to have an alewife committee. And so Penobscot had one, and one of the first things we did was um, create committees in Brooksville and Sedgwick, and then brought them together to form this sort of three-town alewife committee that works together with Simon and myself and others to do all these goals they set up, monitoring alewife populations, restoring access to their fisheries that had alewives, um, managing those populations, whether they're recreational or commercial harvest, and then again, you know, this pygmy alewife is sneaking into the conversation, um, restore a, a fishery to that, and just to make this all sustainable so that it, this happens and, and keeps happening the way they should. So first we'll talk about that monitoring piece. And that's, this basically is counting fish and taking samples with alewives, we take uh, scale samples from the fish. And from that, you can find out, you count rings like a tree, you can find out how old those fish are and you can find out how many times they've spawned before, and that tells you a lot about the health of the run and the fish weight coming up. And the way we count them, oh, here's the, our count so far this year are really close to a half a million, which is pretty exciting. Um, and the way we count these, and then we, so we fill these data sheets out here. This year, actually, because of COVID, our data sheets do not look like this anymore. They look like a Google sheet and a text message. And so we're doing things a little bit different this year, but actually, it was 
it's been pretty easy to find volunteers looking for things to do. So it has its ups and downs. Um, but basically to count fish, um, and again, and this video might be a little bit choppy, is we split the day up into four three hour periods where a volunteer will go out and count fish for a half an hour during each of those periods and we'll extrapolate that out for an estimate. Um, and so um, this is at Walker Pond where it's a pretty easy fish way to see fish swimming through. That's them getting ready to go through and you just sit there with a hand clicker and count them and then we estimate passage from that. I thought that wasn't too bad. Um, a lot of the other work, this is something I wasn't expecting because I dealt with some of these, I didn't have to really deal with these in Alaska because salmon are much better jumpers than alewives and can usually hop right over a lot of these things. But it turns out that beavers, you know, alewife streams are really a perfect place to dam up for a beaver. And so, and there's quite a few less natural predators for beaver around now. There's not as much trapping that goes on. And so there's a lot of beaver around. And they're great to have the rest of the year, but when alewives are trying to swim up as adults or leave as adults or leave as juveniles, a beaver dam can completely stop fish movement past there. And so several hundred hours of, of work basically go into notching these beaver dams during the important times when the fish are going back and forth. And so I, beavers are always a, a controversial topic when this comes up because they're cute, they're furry, and maybe we're messing with their dams for a little bit. We have to get permits to do it, um, but um, they're an important piece of, of what an alewife has to go through to get back to the pond. <clears throat> so this is where uh, Maine Coast Heritage Trust and, and other folks, so when I was talking to the, these folks about alewife committees and management, Siona was having the same conversations about how do we get fish back into these ponds that used to have fish. And so this is a, a picture of two of the, the first out of five projects that Maine Coast is leading the effort on. Um, this is Whites and Pierce Pond, um, non-respectively. So Pierce on top, Whites on the bottom. And you can see the top one at Pierce Pond, there was an old earthen dam um, that was, it was making it really hard for fish to get in and it wasn't good for pond water levels. And so, that along with uh, the fishway at White's Pond where there was a really bad shaped concrete dam that had about four foot of a drop where the town folks in Penobscot were having to hand dip every single one of 40,000 to 60,000 fish over that dam um, every single year. And it slowed the juveniles leaving and caused all kinds of problems. And if it weren't for all the work that they were doing manually putting fish one way or another over the pond, it would completely shut off. And they wouldn't have had the, the you know, sticking power to keep doing that without this sort of work where Siona worked with landowners um, and with funding agencies. These are expensive projects to be able to create passage in these, um, in these two ponds. And then I'll talk a little bit more about the, the future work that's going to go on in the other ponds. So we talked about those, those, again, those two red slashes where there wasn't passage. Um, that's the work that's, that's coming up that's going to be, that right now, Sino has got the funding for and has the partners for to be able to complete those two projects and to go into Walker Pond as well to do some, um, some work on the, the fishway where it isn't an ideal fishway and there's some downstream passage issues. And so it'll be more of an improvement project than a restoration project there. Um, and just to note, I think what's made this restoration successful has been um, Maine Coast Heritage Trust's work at that local level, you know, from the ground up, as opposed to the government coming in saying, hey, we'll fix your fishway, here's a million dollars. This is getting the support at the grassroots level and then building up from there and make, seeing the projects through. And so um, very soon, we'll have fish back in Parker and Frost Pond and some of the other work that I've helped coordinate with the State Department of Marine Resources is getting new fish in there before the fishways are even done. So they're slated right now to be um, fixed at Frost and Parker Pond in 2021. And this, is, this year was the third year where we took fish out of Walker Pond and stocked them into those two ponds so that, remember when I said the life cycle, they spend three years in the ocean before coming back. Those fish, um, that have been stocked for three years will be knocking at the door when those fishways are replaced or created and will 
um, see those fish coming back to those ponds. And so another really cool thing here is that um, the, the folks in the, in the Bagaduce River towns said, you know, usually when the state stocks ponds, they use them from a fishway in Augusta because it's easy to get fish there and water. And so they stock from these stocks that they've always used. Well, folks in these towns said, these are Bagaduce fisheries and we want Bagaduce fish in them. And so they made a special kind of case for us where they allow us to get fish from Walker Pond. You'll see in the top right, um, you know, some folks um, running back and forth with nets of fish that load this stocking truck. And then we've got pretty terrible access in a couple of these ponds. And so we end up having to do some, some interesting maneuvers to get um, fish back there and into the pond. But it's great to see them um, getting out of there. So okay, we'll talk about the, the little alewives now. So pygmy alewives were this, the, the fish going into Walker Pond were, are smaller than the other ponds. And back in the 80s, a biologist at DMR noticed this and documented it. And without a whole lot of justification beyond from that closed the, the Walker Pond run to any kind of harvest. In most ponds in, in Maine, you're allowed to dip net 25 fish per day per person. And so we had these small fish in there. Nobody really knew why, but they said, okay, they might be special. So who knows, maybe it's a subspecies. So we better protect them. So they did. And they said, no fishing in Walker Pond, which basically took out that you know, connection, getting your hands on a fish is really the way people connect with, with fish. And so it sort of took away that connection. And one of those goals of the, the alewife committee was get that connection back and get us to be able to get our hands on some of these fish and to be part of um, that fishery again. And so this is my uh, weird animated sort of way of <clears throat> going through what it is. So nobody really knew what a, a, a pygmy alewife was. And that's where, you know, myself as a scientist could come in and say, okay, well, let's figure this out for real and find out if it is something um, that we really need to worry about. And so the main theories around why they might be different was one, genetics, um, or two, maybe there's some sort of diet restriction that started, that's sort of stunting their growth when they're juveniles and slowing it down, and then they just don't grow as fast as they would otherwise. And so we took genetic samples, worked with a professor from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and it turns out they're smack dab in the middle of any other northern run of alewives, um, and so it's not a genetic reason that they're smaller fish. The food uh, work that we've done, the zooplankton sampling, looks like there's, there's nothing different there, although we're still waiting for some data um, to come back on that. And <clears throat> it's really pointing to the fact that just because um, there could be some food issues, or not issues, just unique food um, sources in this pond, or obstacles they have to get through to get to the pond that just sort of dictates that smaller fish get into this pond better. And so they've evolved to be smaller fish um, over the several hundred years that this dam and this fishway have been in here. And so we're to the point where I think DMR is gonna allow a, har a recreational harvest there if the town wants one next year. So this has just been kind of a side project for an interesting um, rule that was out there. And again, it's about sustainability and about thinking about the future. And so a lot of the, the work that these committees do and that Simon and I support and help out is getting, and this wasn't this year, of course, um, but, um, but it's this year, instead of this, what we did was we put together a video for the kids um, and encouraged them to get out to these, these fisheries and, and play with the alewives and connect with them the way their parents and their grandparents had. But it's really about bringing that next generation um, into this work, into this shared sort of responsibility and ownership of these local runs. And it's about values. <clears throat> um, you know, these, these fish are bait. Um, they're food for ground fish. They're food for, um, like I said, everything out there that eats them. And, and without that real cultural connection and those values that come with this fish as a connector between coastal and the ocean, um, in those communities, this work isn't going to happen. And as part of those values, you know, one way this, this fish was a value and one way to incentivize this stewardship going forward, these communities recognize that we used to commercially fish these when they were coming back, which you can do at a sustainable level when you're watching fish come back and you're counting them because you know you're kind of with the kind of um, effect you're having on that population because you're taking fish, you know how many that was, you know how many fish passed otherwise and you keep track of that and keep that sustainable. And something that was a huge success this year was working 
you know, alongside DMR and the communities and the federal government, and we were able to shepherd in a, a policy or a, a amendment to the Maine Sustainable Fishery Management Plan that had to get approved by the federal government to start allowing a harvest. Um, before this, you needed 10 years of data to collect before you could have any kind of fishery. And so this amendment to the Sustainable Fishery Management Plan allowed um, the town of Penobscot to fish for the first time this year in anyone's memory um, to have a small incremental commercial fishery. So they were able to harvest 15% um, of the run um, this year and were able to sell those as bait. And that's just an incentive, sort of a carrot for them to, to keep doing this work and to be being part of this along with the, the benefits of just having these, um, these natural ecosystems and working order in their communities. And this is just kind of a slide showing really what success at the broader scale can be. And this is, a, I think, a really conservative estimate. This shows what, um, what folks think can come back if we can open passage up to the main drainages in, in Maine. And this shows 55 million fish. That's a whole lot. When you think about the, the babies that are out in the ocean swimming around, it's literally billions of fish. And honestly, this number is probably about half what it should be because it's assuming that um, fish populate ponds at only about 235 fish per acre, which is um, about half of what we're seeing, at least in the streams that, that we're counting on. And bringing it back to that co-management effort, um, <clears throat> really we can't afford, I think, not to do this, to play, to have these local, this local knowledge and these local resources be a part of, um, and the capacity that, that happens, at, whether it's this scale or the lobster fishery scale or whatever it is, um, we can't afford not to be part of that management. Um, this just shows that same alewife graph that we talked about earlier on the left. <clears throat> and on the right, there's a graph that looks pretty darn similar for um, cod landings in the same area. And so you can see there's also been a drop off on that. And part of the reason, one of the, one of the theories around that is there's a lot less food for them out there. We haven't nailed that completely down, um, but and another, you know, there, unfortunately with cod and a lot of other species out in the ocean, we don't have a stream that we can drive to with our cars and count and watch them go into a pond that we know that we used to swim in. Um, in the open ocean, when you're looking at monitoring and management, you know, someone described this sort of um, work to me as, you know, it's just like counting trees, except the trees are invisible and they move around. And so it's hard to, to, to nail down some of these things at the scale. But what we are starting to be able to do, and this is this um, little um, graphic on the right, is showing some of the subpopulations that we're, we figured out. And this was actually done through some work interviewing fishermen and saying, where did you used to catch fish that were full of eggs and things like that? So we are starting to narrow down those um, populations that are out in an open ocean where it's harder to find which ones and that we have to manage and what scale to do that. So. Um, it's a different style of co-management that happens in different fisheries, but it's really all about scale and how we do it. And this is just one piece of other work that we're doing that I won't talk about much, but this is um, a plan for one of the years that we run our, our Sentinel survey that Pat's gonna actually be giving a, a, a lunch and learn talk on later this summer, um, where he's gonna talk about an inshore um, abundance estimate survey that we do in the Gulf of Maine where we get in areas where the federal surveys can't get into. And so just a little teaser for that talk, it really connects with this um, as alewives is such an important, uh, again, species to these ground fish. And I think I just have one more beaver slide. There. Get it? It's a beaver sliding. There's no last time I do that in person and it's especially quiet when I do it in my own office by myself. Um, so with that, um, I will, there's my little kiddo Watson playing with an alewife and making his, some of his first connections to the fishery. And so I will um, turn it over to Siona to fill in any gaps. Like I said, it's a really, the other cool story about this is the partnership that it, it is between not just the communities and nonprofits, but between the nonprofits themselves and the fact that this work, none of this work would happen without everyone on board. So um, they're really important partners and please fill in, you know, why it's such an important thing to land trusts and, you know, 
your angle. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, hi, everyone. I'm glad to be here with you on screen. So my name is Siona. I work with Maine Coast Heritage Trust, as Mike mentioned, and I uh, am one of the field staff. I work with landowners around the state uh, to do conservation projects. And you might wonder why I'm part of Alewife projects and how I got to work with Mike on fish. But as Mike went through earlier in terms of the life cycle of Alewife, these fish need land and water. These are such a connector between our ponds, our streams, our rivers, and our ocean. And that land ownership and the, the needs and angles tied to land is what I do, which is how Mike and I were able to then figure out that we needed to work together around this species that depends so heavily on healthy land and maybe dams uh, being removed and other projects on land. Uh, healthy, clear streams and oceans. So this was such a clear connection for us to start working together. Um, and it's been really a fun adventure to work on together. So M Mike mentioned the projects that are underway. We're, we've been working for a few years now together with a lot of other entities and government agencies and towns and community members on a set of five restoration projects. Mike showed those. Those are each different. Each one has its own special um, needs and, and circumstances. Each one involves a lot of landowners, um, both on the ponds and on the streams, but sometimes also directly on the projects where these are happening. Um, and we have needed the town government support in each of the towns. So have worked really closely with the select boards on a number of aspects of these projects. And sometimes the towns have really been in the driver's seat on these projects. So it's been a great way to connect in so tightly with the town around a special natural resource. Um, so Mike mentioned, you know, I'm serving as a coordinator on these projects. I also have had to find a lot of funding. These are expensive. Um, and we still have a ways to go. We're still working on funding. We're still um, working towards these three last projects getting done, we hope, by the end of next year, although that is ambitious. Um, and uh, uh, what else? We've also just worked hard together on building community awareness and support. Mike went through all that, but that's been important for us both to work on together. We. You know, people who are interested in fish might not have thought about the land aspects and people who are interested in land don't always think about the fish. So it's been great to sort of bring our communities together to really work jointly on all the different aspects of these projects. And one thing I like to always remind us all of these are, you know, these projects are construction on the ground. You see excavators, you see all this impressive construction equipment, and there's a change on the land to maybe take out a dam or change a dam the way Mike showed on those slides. But that's not all. And there's so much else that goes into making these projects a success. You need all this work that Mike is helping to lead ahead of time in terms of coordinating volunteers, working with Department of Marine Resources to ensure the stocking of alewives into the ponds ahead of time so that they they know to come home. They want to come back to that same place. You need to create that population in the lead up time to the actual construction projects. And then you need help counting those fish and taking care of the notching the dams and taking care of the systems in the years after the construction project. Otherwise, those alewife can't get up. So there's a lot that goes into each of these. And it's been a really great way to work together and work with a lot of federal, state, town uh, and NGO partners here. Mike, I think I'll leave it at that unless you want me to add something else specific. Nope, that's perfect. Pat, so Pat has also one really quick thing. Um, usually right around this time of year, we, um, we have an alewife celebration out at Pierce Pond or one of the other ponds where we bring a mobile smokehouse that smokes alewives and and about 300 people from the communities and outside um, funnel through and check out some of these projects um, and these fish. Unfortunately, this year we weren't able to do that. Um, 
because of the, the virus going around. But what we did was we all sort of worked together to put together a video for some of the schools around here. And that's gonna be up on our websites, um, on our Facebook pages, really soon after um, this talk. And so please um, go check out that video and you'll see the stuff that I tried to show here in better resolution. And, and it's more of a comprehensive kind of um, get into it down into the into the water and, and all that kind of stuff. So please check that out afterwards. But Pat, do we have any um, questions? Or did everybody uh, read? Yeah, so uh, I've got a couple of questions that came in by email. I'll take, I'll uh, go ahead and fire those at you first. Uh, but uh, just to let folks know, you can, uh, you can ask a question in a couple of different ways. You can use the chat button at the bottom of your screen. I'm not sure what it looks like on your phone if you're using your mobile phone. Um, there's also a Q&A button. You can click on that and type a question in. And you can also raise your hand and I'll, I'll, um, uh, I'll try to pay attention to all three of those things. And if you raise your hand, I'll unmute you and you can ask a question verbally. Um, so before I get to the questions on the screen, um, I'm gonna uh, go to the email um, and uh, ask you uh, some questions that came in by email. So this uh, question is from uh, John Wilson. John writes, uh, thanks for the invitation. I visited the Herring Run uh, a few weeks ago with Susie Shepherd. I think I know her. Um, <laughs> and uh, was pleased to see quite a few fish moving up into Walker Pond. How does this year's run compare with, last, with the last few years? Do you feel confident that the stripers will return in a month or so, or are they already in the bagadoos? Hope to hear good news about this fishery. Thanks. I'm not going to give any good striper spots away, but he's, he probably already has them. Um, so this year has been a really good year. We're still counting fish, so I don't have the final numbers, but um, we've, this is our fourth year counting. Um, the average of the previous years was somewhere around 300,000 fish into Walker Pond, and we're close to 400 this year. Um, that means um, so it's, it's a better run this year. Um, that'll probably translate something into more stripers being around, or at least for longer. Usually they show up around in the Bagadoos kind of later in the summer. I think it's maybe a little bit more coordinated with the juveniles that are, that are leaving during that time because they're an easier prey that come through sort of all at the same time that haven't seen a striper before and maybe get um, picked off a little bit easier. Um, so I, I imagine we'll have another good striper this year, but they do come in, um, you know, some to some degree on the, the adults returning, and um, I imagine there's a, a few out there. And just in general, at least anecdotally, from what I've heard from fishermen, is that the striper fishing out in Blue Hill Bay and the Bagaduce River has been a little bit better over the last four or five years than it was in more recent memory. And so um, these fish, coming back and the restoration of these, you know, other two ponds, um, bumping those numbers up and spreading more adult and juvenile alewives out throughout the Bagadus River and, and other main streams. Um, the restoration that happened in the Penobscot River that's bringing back millions of fish that weren't before, is just, just gonna mean more predator fish out there. And so um, we don't know if it's always gonna be the same as it was in the past. It could be new species moving around because of global warming or whatever, but, but um, this is going to do nothing but good things for the striper fishery. Uh, okay, uh, a couple more questions by email, and then I'll start taking questions from, uh, from the participants on the call. Uh, this question is from Al Benner. Al writes, as a fisherman of the Bagadoos for striped bass, I'm curious to know what, the ro what role alewife play as a feedstock for migratory stripers that show up in July and August. Tons of food. <laughs> and I kind of said in the last one, but yeah, again, this is food all summer and fall long for those guys. And um, <clears throat> a lot of those, you know, those cod stocks that we're starting to figure out, really, if you looked at those overlapped with a lot of the, the bigger runs of alewife and river herring. So the other species of, of river herring that are lumped in with, um, with alewives are um, blueback herring. They have pretty much the same life cycle. They extend a little bit further south along the coast um, and they come in and spawn in sort of slow moving water and don't swim as far up into ponds. Um, so um, a lot of those cod maps and you know, cod were eating these and stripers were eating these. They, if you overlap them with the major producers, major systems and producers of river herring, 
they're pretty tied together, which is one of the one of the other reasons why we think there could be a connection there. And so I'm sure it's the same with some of the, the striped bass um, migrations. A uh, question from Andy Burt. Um, have you been collaborating with the Wabanaki efforts to reopen historic runs for alewives? So there's a, um, Simon, you can talk a little, a little bit about this too, but um, both of our organizations are part of a Downey's a group of organizations called the Downey's Fisheries Partnership. Um, that's, we're the ones that are working more locally in the Bagadoos, but it really ties together down east Maine from the Penobscot all the way to the Canadian border um, with um, economic groups, um, with local governments, um, and, and lots of other nonprofit organizations. And there is some connection with those efforts. And there actually has been some connection with them um, on the Bagadoos. Last year, they lent us a pit tag reader that we use to tag a bunch of alewives that we put in um, one of the streams that Simon is working on restoring in um, Brooksville, where there was, and this is a cool traditional knowledge kind of story, where there were fish that, you know, used to make it into this pond and they don't anymore. And it's because of this dam at the top, like I said, and when an engineer came out, they said, okay, well, they can't get over this other spot either. You know, fish won't be able to get past this. It was like an old mill site. And everyone in town said, well, they always did. And the engineer was like, no, you know, the numbers say that it has to be this gradient or whatever. And they say, well, they always did. And so we were able to borrow a pit tag reader, which is like an easy pass for a fish that you put a tag into um, that you can set up across a stream. And then if you tag a fish, um, you can detect it when it goes over this thing. So we put these tags in these alewives um, about the size of a couple of Tic Tacs lined up and put this antenna across above where the engineer said they couldn't get, but the town folks said they could. And lo and behold, the fish made it, um, enough of the fish made it past that, that we were able to say that they were able to and potentially reduce some of the, the cost of the project. And that was all because of a partnership um, with the, the tribal groups. And so um, the, this fish has been, um, the Passamaquoddy name for these fish is basically the fish that feeds all. And so these fish have been hugely important to tribal um, organizations and tribal group, groups in Maine and um, up and down on the East Coast. And so there is that connection there. And again, on that Down East Fisheries Partnership group. And I know a lot of the work that, that land trusts do um, really connects with those tribes. And so I don't know, you can maybe add to that. I don't know. Yeah, I don't have much to add directly around alewife restoration runs other than that. Um, particularly the Penobscot tribe's work on restoration projects has been tied to the same, many of the same partners, not the local ones, but a lot of the same funding agencies and partners as part of the Penobscot watershed effort as these projects are. So been in the same circles and I, as Mike mentioned, and other ways of, of connecting our work, I, I do a lot of work with um, various Wabanaki um, we were, it was great to share equipment last year specifically with them. Um, and we also work with the Passamaquoddy down east, but not as much on the restoration projects. There are other groups that are helping them, like Downey Salmon Federation is giving quite a bit of help up there. So a lot of different connections, not necessarily directly with us on that. Uh, from Peter Sly, could you talk more specifically about the relationship of alewives to the lobster and salmon fisheries? So as far as salmon, uh, one of the biggest connections is the fact that, um, and this I probably should have mentioned, is that so they are both anadromous fish, um, alewives and salmon, and elvers move up and down the same corridors, and so do brook trout and a lot of other fish. Um, and so one of the other really important, one of the other reasons why these are keystone species is the fact that you create passage for an alewife. When, when we're, Simon is going in and, and getting these projects engineered, they're engineered to pass all the kinds of fish that might come back through. And so if it's good for an alewife, it's good for a salmon and the salmon are endangered right now. And so these are important um, to that work as well. Um, and any other fish that's gonna go back and across um, these barriers that might exist now. And as far as lobster goes, I would say that alewives do represent a potential um, 
a potential reduction in dependency on other species of fish for other sources for bait. Um, it's kind of debatable on how much, how much of a dent. They can't replace herring and other fish that right now are being used predominantly as lobster bait, but they can definitely um, put some kind of dent into that and at the same time provide some sort of, you know, potential resources for towns that might be selling them as bait where, um, as folks around here know, purses are pretty tight, especially right now at the town level and any sort of, um, any sort of money flowing into the town governments is a, is a really important thing. So when they have a commercial fishery, usually what happens is the town will have the right to fish, the sole right to fish, and they'll put something out to bid for harvesters. You know, Joe Schmo will come in and say, they'll pay a thousand dollars to harvest this run. And so they'll be able to harvest it, keep the profit, but they've got to pay the town. It works different ways, but this can be a potential money source for towns. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty timely fishery for a lot of, for halibut fishing as well, where these fish are coming back right when people are getting geared up to go halibut fishing. Um, and <clears throat> they do make really good fresh bait for the lobster fishery. And one other just quick thing around that I think is, it's, there's gonna be something in the next few years around the infrastructure as these other fisheries come online, that's gonna kind of dictate how much of a dent it can put into the, to the lobster dependence on, on bait and, and where it comes from is right now it's just kind of, you know, one town here, another town here harvesting fish, not too many in the, in the state. For it to actually go somewhere in replacing some of that dependency and being able to sell them at the right time, there's gonna to have to be infrastructure built to be able to say, you know, bring in fish from 15 or 20 different harvests, um, freeze them and store them there and try to sell them when the bait is really needed because the, the LY front doesn't always match up when there's shortages of bait. So I don't know if that answers it. Simon, do you have anything else on the Atlantic salmon? No, not really. I think you covered the two important things, but the, um, you know, there is a real hope that, that creating another localized bait source could be such a good thing for the lobster industry, just given some of the real crunches on bait in the last couple of years, it would be a, a good thing. All right, from, uh, from Pam Abishan Fields. Hi, Pam. Uh, we miss seeing you in the office. Hopefully we'll be back together soon. Um, Pam writes, uh, uh, what's the lifespan of an alewife? Uh, and if Walker pygmy alewives are introduced into par uh, Parker Pond, and if Parker has a different food, uh, different food and impacts the growth of the alewife, how many years before you would see a difference in your studies? So those are very good questions, Pam. I was, I was gonna yell at you if they were too hard. <laughs> but um, so about, they can live to be about nine years old. I talked to the state, um, the head biologist, the manager at the state, and he was, or no, it was actually the guy who ages every scale. This guy's job is the one guy in the state of Maine the ages, every scale, we take 100 scales from every run. So this guy spends a month out of the year right now stocking fish, and he spends the other 11 months looking at a microfiche machine, those old ones you'd see in a library, with scales underneath them counting rings. Um, so this guy's happy to be out in the field right now. But anyway, he was really stoked, um, you know, nerding out on the fact that last year they saw two eight-year-old fish in the state of Maine, um, which, can show that you know things are doing well in the open in the ocean conditions and things like that, and that you know this restoration is, is benefiting things. Um, so eight nine years old is about how long they can live, and so they'll spawn the first time um, <clears throat> right around three or four years old, and then they can spawn. Um, usually they don't spawn every year after that; they'll take a year off here and there, but they can repeat spawn up until they're eight years old, and then. Oh yeah, so the, that's the, the, and we don't like to, even though I have a pygmy alewife slide in there, I try not to say that they're pygmy alewives too much because it really isn't, they're smaller fish. But, um, but the, because I get yelled at from the people in Brooksville and Sedgwick if I call them pygmy alewives. But um, the, the answer is, you're right. So we would, add, if it's something in the food, the diet, um, or the you know, natural stream conditions, we'd actually see it, well, if there's something in a diet, we'd see it pretty quick. 
they would they you know they'd be doing great in the pond they probably come back as smaller fish so it would take a while for that the fact that it, if it's just you know one little narrow spot they've all got to swim up that's making them small it would take quite a while for that to to play out genetically um, but if it's something food wise we'd actually see it pretty quick and one and so it's kind of an experiment putting those fish into that pond um, to see whether or not they come back small or not because we're putting them into a different pond and we'll see what they look like coming back but I can tell you that the juveniles that we saw leaving Parker Pond um, a year or two ago were like three times bigger than the one the juveniles leaving any other pond in the Bagadoos and so um, part of that's probably because they're only stocked at like six fish per acre so they've got like unlimited food um, they're not you know when they're stacked in at like 600 fish for every acre they're really fighting for food and the, the more you know fish you pack into there the less food the babies have but um, yeah we'll see pretty quickly if it's a food thing and over a pretty long period of time if it's something you know where their morphological characteristics or their size is being dictated because of of something that happened over 100 years good question great question i'm going to try to go through a a, a couple more and um, um please don't be discouraged if we don't get to you uh, i think we're going to try to write uh some answers to your questions if you have them uh, and try to provide them back to you so um this one's from uh john kimball have you been developing a system to anticipate and control water outflow that includes a shoreline erosion and fish access Say that again. Uh, have you been developing a system to anticipate and control water outflow that includes shoreline erosion and fish access? All right. So I'll let Sam so jump in on some of it. I know that one of the the really, I mean, I think what this the question is is about climate change and and things changing, and are we planning for that? One of the the issues that we've had, at, for instance, Walker Pond, I said some of the project there is more of a improvement than a restoration is that in years where we have really low water in the fall um, and there's just a trickle of stream leaving and the juveniles have to get out of there, they'll wait as long as they can, but eventually they'll know ice is coming. And so even if it's trickle going out of the brook, they'll start leaving. And this is, we're talking about amounts of water that you know leaves can dam up. And so you'll lose thousands of fish in little leaf dams because there's not enough water um, leaving the pond as much as they're used to and we're seeing more and more falls where we don't have that much you know those big fall rains and so one of the improvements there is to install a downstream passage chute um, separate from the one that's currently there that we could put boards into the, the fishway that's there and then it wouldn't take very much water at all going over this chute for juveniles to to be able to leave safely and they wouldn't have to worry about those those leaf dams. Um, and Sion, I'll let you, if there's anything else about erosion and things like that, I don't know as much about the engineering of projects as you. Yeah, I'll speak to that a little bit. Um, I'll give two examples where we really had to think about uh, issues of water level change and uh, I guess it is climate change considerations. There's shoreline, they call it living shoreline in sort of the government lingo. Um, at Pierce Pond in Penobscot, when we did that project, the old earthen dam that was there <clears throat> was about 90 feet long. So the picture that Mike showed was really of only a narrow opening in it where we did that nature lake fishway, the set of rocked pools coming up that kept pond levels pretty similar to the way they always were, or not always, but the way they have been in the last couple decades, um, and allow the fish to go up and down. But another part of that project that is not as visible was installing plastic sheeting underwater on the side of the pond for the rest of that 90 foot dam. And that's because there was so much leakage going through there that had we had a 100 year flood event, it could have been dangerous. There was a possibility of that dam blowing out. So this was a way to help maintain, not only maintain water levels and keep the dam working the way we, or the fishway the way we want it to, but also really thinking ahead about 100 year flood events and, and changes that we may see over time. The other place where we've really had to think about this is um, 
the project we hope is coming down the pike and Sedgwick on the Snows Brook culvert, um, which is right on Route 15. Um, and that is where, you know, we had to have the engineer design in um, an 80 to 100 year lifespan of a culvert. And when you do that so close to salt water uh, and tidal water, you really have to look in depth at the different uh, possibilities in terms of what the shoreline is going to look like, what the water level is going to look like. Um, so that was definitely engineered into that project and was part of the considerations because it is on a highway. So those are two examples of how we have to think about it. These, one key thing, these fishways is that these are built to last. We are not only just taking out a dam or making changes, but trying to make these as low maintenance and as long lasting as, as we really can. And so you do have to think ahead about all those aspects of, of water levels um, while you engineer and build these. So definitely taken into consideration. Anything else, Pat? Looks like Pat froze up for a second. Oh, yeah. Um, I thought maybe it just shut off because it was at the end of the 30 minutes. Um, it for, did. That's one of those technical things we'll figure out. Uh, nice job, Mike <laughs> and Siona. Thank you very much. Um, to folks, thank you for attending. Hope you appreciated that. As you can see on your screen, we'll be posting this uh, to our website along with other things. Uh, please go there and learn more about us. Uh, the next webinar that we'll be doing, our Lunch and Learn in the series, will be on June 26th, again at 12.30 p.m., and there'll be announcements and a registration opportunity for that. We hope you'll join us. The topic will be the halibut fishery, and we have a scientist from DMR and probably some other uh, knowledgeable folks who will be part of that presentation. And go to our, web, our Facebook page and check out the, the video. It's pretty awesome. Anything else, Mike? Nope. Thank you. Thanks, Iona. Thanks, everybody. Be safe. Be well.